Formnext 2024, and I'm at the MX3D booth inside their machine with Thomas. How's it going? What's going on, man? Well, you're very welcome. It's very <laughs> safe because it's not turned on, so uh, we're yeah, good. Yeah, that's just we're it. Good. When the doors are closed, obviously the machine can operate and move, and safety procedures are in place, so if the doors are open, the machine can stop. Yeah. Yeah, and listen to that. Metal. It's the real deal. 630 kilogram of uh, stainless steel. This is right here, yeah. 630 kg. Printed in around seven days, so it's one of the <laughs> fastest printing processes uh, you'll see at Formex. So we've seen lots of different metal additive processes, and this one is obviously not powder bed. This is a robotic arm giving you metal at the end of a welding tip, right? Correct. So not powder, we're using wire, and compared to all the processes, maybe we're quite close or the closest to traditional uh, manufacturing because we're just doing general welding, but we're stacking the welds on top of each other and that allows us to make uh, objects in 3D. Well, stacking the welds on top of each other, I like that you said that because all of my friends that are machinists say welds are stronger than the material. Yeah, typically they mean when you weld, you also weaken the area next to the weld, so that makes the weld typically the, stronger lo the strongest locally. Okay. But of course, you can use welding wires which have higher performance than the base material and then of course, it's, uh, that's definitely the case. But if the whole thing's a weld, you're good, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it very much leans on welding, so it is indeed the welding quality. If you look at the comparison between casting, welding, other manufacturing technologies, maybe forging, you'll see that this is very much in line with welding quality and sometimes even uh, above that. Uh, because we just not do only one weld and we do welds on top of each other, we have some type of micro annealing process which then increases the performance of the weld below by inputting the heat. So sometimes our objects outperform uh, what we actually expect them. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, you get that performance for free just from yeah. your process, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's great about it. Also, we have made really big uh, parts in the past that we had to weld together because they were too big. And then we saw that the human welds were the weakest welds and the automated welds were of the highest quality or okay. the, the best. And this is an automated robotic arm here doing the welds for you. And it can build within this entire booth, essentially. Yeah, this is a system we launched a couple of years ago. It can go up to 750. This is 630 kilograms. So we have a little bit of space, uh, but we also have a bigger system that can go to 20,000 kilograms. Jeez, and how big is that machine? Uh, well, it's, I would say it's around the size of our booth, so that's why we didn't bring it, because otherwise everybody would be standing inside yeah, the machine. Yeah, we'd all be standing inside yeah, the yeah. booth. Have you seen these toilets? They're ginormous! Let's talk about the technology that's going here. You've got a robotic arm, so multi-axis. Correct. And you've got yourself a little build table here. Yeah. This steel plate, that's the only thing that's not 3D printed, and after the 3D print, we cut off the steel plate and we end up with a fully 3D printed object. Ah, uh, okay, so you're still welding onto the plate and then you're cutting it at the end, Typically, right? Typically, we need some type of metal to start from and then we go up. And you said this is stainless, correct? Yeah, this is stainless steel 316. Can you do other metals in this? We typically can print with anything that's weldable. So we have, I would say, 90, 99% uh, success. Of course, it's different than just putting down one weld. We need to see how it stacks up. We need to adjust the parameters for an even buildup. And once we're there, it could take a couple of hours. We can go into 3D space with it. Okay, and as far as going into 3D space, what is the volume that you can print within this machine? So this machine goes about 180, 220, 150. So pretty big volume. Pretty big. But uh, I would say this is a turnkey solution, so our customers print inside this box. But we use off-the-shelf robotics, so we can basically build any system. We can put bigger robots, bigger tracks, horizontal, vertical. So we, in a way, we can go unlimited in any dimension. Unlimited power. For this piece, this is a, this is a just printed piece. Yeah, and there hasn't right. been any post done on no. it, right? So what is the post processing for a piece like this? So we focus on the metal printing process. We have the roughness of the welding, and typically then we take it uh, with post processing one, two millimeter off, and then we have the precision part underneath. So we- Oh, just over, one or two millimeters? Yeah, we oversize it uh, a little bit, and then we bring it back. So we have a uh, limited uh, material waste in the milling stage, for example. Um, 
The amount of millimeter we take off depends on the roughness of the print. And when we're talking about, in general, being able to just uh, mill a millimeter or two off, the amount of waste from this process is far, far less than what would be typically wasted when Definitely. making this with like a legacy method, right? Definitely. You know, if you would mill this out of a block, the block would be like this and I would estimate... It would be huge. It would be huge. I would estimate 90% plus material waste. There's uh, other dimensions you could also think of. We are using any welding wire. You cannot find any type of uh, alloy in a billet in a big block. Some of them you can cast, some of them you can forge, but not everything is available. But we just built from zero to 100 with the welding wire. So the availability of this big billet is, is not of a concern to us. And the welding wire that you're talking about, this is, like you said, off-the-shelf components. This is stuff Again, that you can source anywhere, right? Yeah. No, we really want to make a platform that they can pick, they can have the best lead time on the wire, and also if one wire would maybe be out of stock or get a price increase, they can just swap to another wire and just continue. And then for this welding wire and your customers, being able to get it anywhere, I would assume that your machine and, and your ability to make this isn't, isn't restricted to Amsterdam where you're located or Europe where you're in, like you're yeah. global, right? Yeah, uh, we're located in Amsterdam, uh, but we have systems now on every continent except Antarctica. Okay, so one of the things I really wanted to bring up and what you guys out there are gonna be really, well, you're gonna be, this is gonna be cool. Uh, you probably have heard of this company before because you've printed a bridge in Amsterdam, correct? Yeah, that is correct. Uh, this was the result. Uh... Well, th this is not the real bridge. We are not giants. Like, this is a scale model, right? Yeah, correct. Uh, the bridge weighs around 6,000 kilograms, all 3D metal. Uh, 3D metal printed, all fully done with our software, all fully done in Amsterdam. It's around 12 meters long, um, yeah, and we're really proud of it. You should be, that was amazing, and that really, when we came to your booth, I, your company looked familiar, and it was because we had seen about the bridge in Amsterdam. And even as a scale model, this is, this is really cool to hold on to, but the, the bridge itself, when you guys were printing it, did you come from both sides? The, the goal was to print from both sides. The initial moonshot project was to print on location, yeah. but because we're dealing with welding, safety, very important, yeah. we had to do some uh, minor changes in order to, to make the production possible. Uh, of course, we were a startup company in 2014 when the moonshot idea was launched, and the undertaking to manufacture a bridge of this size uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a big project, so luckily we got help from a lot of partners to make this possible oh, as really? well. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tier 1 companies in every field did reach out to us and they did help us uh, make it uh, come a reality. We got help from robotics companies, welding companies, structural engineers, uh, City of Amsterdam, of course. They were also really keen on the idea, so it was really everybody coming together, putting their uh, heads together and making it all it's a wonderful project. It's epic, bro. I know the bridge was brought over to us, the scale model bridge, and we've seen the big machine, but there's a few other things at the booth that I really wanted to talk sure. about. Can we go see those? Yeah, let's, let's go. All right, let's go. I got to step out of a machine. <laughs> <laughs> now I wrote a part that I really want to talk about because it's like it, it shows the next stage from that machine. So this is the part, what it looked like coming off the machine, and then it's now shiny and holes are tapped. And I want to know a little bit more about this. How long did this take to print? So the end weight is around 350 kilograms after milling. This took us around two weeks to print, 24-7. And then when we go to the manufacturing, the post-processing of it, that's around one week. So one three, week. three weeks total from zero to final part. Is a machine like that doing the post-processing as well? No, we just focus on the wire arc, the 3D printing, and we leave the post-processing up to any traditional manufacturer. Oh, okay, so they order the part from you and then someone else is doing the post-processing. Yeah. Okay, well, that makes They put sense. it on the mill, they mill it like any other conventional object, and then we get the final. Oh, that's perfect. Part. I just look, it's so nice and smooth, yeah. and the holes are tapped, and it's just, like you said earlier, it's, it's just like a metal part. Yeah. It's a metal part, right? What kind of metal is it? Uh, this is a copper aluminum nickel. Copper aluminum nickel. And what would be the use for this part? It's an impeller for a water pump to cool down a power plant. So oh. pretty important uh, part. In Very the important, <laughs> yeah. And this, though, this is really fascinating. So this shows what the original part looked like. So this was cast, correct? Correct. And then this part here, the, the porosity is so much different. The 3D printed part is not just easier to make, but it looks better, which means functionally it's better, right? So functionally, we're definitely equal performance, much beyond, I would say. Uh, it's very clear from the porosity. And we could go even further. We could use alloys that you cannot cast 
or we could do internal structures which are impossible with conventional manufacturing. Oh, right, so we can also exceed the performance, maybe reduce the weight, maybe balance it even better. Now you said, now obviously you make big parts, big parts really fast, right? Aren't there smaller parts that you've made that you yeah. might want to show me? Yeah, this is 350. We got a seven kilogram part as well. Can we go see it? Yeah, let's go. Let's go. It's about seven kilos. It's, <laughs> it's one of the smallest we have here on the booth. Like this is a familiar shape. This is a car part, Thomas. Yeah, that's correct. This is an aluminum structural car part, fully 3D printed. Structural, and, I, and that's the part we, I really want to focus on because it's not a wire harness or a peg or a jig or something. This is structure of a car. Yeah. Made with your tech. Made with our technology, but uh, we were very honored that we could show it on our booth because it's actually made by a BMW group. The BMW group. Yeah. Very familiar with the BMW group. Wow. Now it's not finished, is that on purpose? Yeah, this part is actually only partially finished because BMW group uh, did a lot of structural research and they found out through structural uh, loading uh, that the performance was okay. So we can drastically uh, reduce the cost because we only need the surfaces oh. uh, post-process that need the, uh, to connect to other parts. You can have less expensive parts that are performing just as well on exactly. your car. Exactly, yeah. What's the timeline for seeing a structural 3D printed part in a car? What, what's the timeline for this? I know you can't mention too much, but, but when, when might this be in a car? Well, uh, it's a very futuristic looking part. It is. So maybe we are looking far in the future, but BMW Group is actually going to do uh, vehicle trials next year already with this next technology. Year. So next that's, year? It's amazing. Oh, that's huge. Oh, this is cool. Well, Thomas, I'm going to shake your hand because this has been an amazing trip through your booth. But before we close it out, I want you to look at the camera right there and let everybody know where they can find out more about MX3D. You can find us at MX3D.com. That's it. That's it. If you made this far, you're awesome. Don't forget to hug each other more. Fight for a cause you believe in and metal print all the big things, right? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. And as always, high five. All right, give one to the audience, and now you get one too. Oh, crisp.